And the average lifespan of a mortgage is really two to three years right now. What's going on everyone? Andrew McManaman here with Living in Michigan and I have a special guest here with Iris Mortgage. We have Chris Thomas. Welcome finally to this video. There's been so many people that have been asking for this video, asking for these questions that are all over the country. So I figured let's bring the professional in here and bring him in here and answer these questions. So let's jump right on to it. So Chris, I guess just, just go over and just do an introduction real quick. Like wh what's Iris? Where'd it come from? What's going on with it? Okay, got you. So Iris Mortgage is a, a mortgage brokerage my wife and I started in 2021. We were in the industry for five years prior. She was a processor, I was a loan officer. So she was doing the back end, I was doing the front. We combined our superpowers and came up with our own brokerage when we had our first child, which was kind of a breaking point in finding work-life balance. Um, Iris is the Michigan State wildflower, so subtle nod to Michigan. Who came up with the name? My wife and I both came up with oh, yeah. like, just like we like the purple vibe, the flower, everything like that. Sure. So I'm gonna jump right into these questions right here after that introduction. So I have my sheet here. So you guys sent me all these questions and I just wrote them down so I wouldn't miss any. So we're gonna go right down the list and go right through them. So the first one, a lot of people have been having this question lately and will it's will we run into issues getting it pre-approved when let's just say you don't live in the state of Michigan or you're not from the state of Michigan, how does that work? So how exactly is there gonna be hardship in for someone not only not living in Michigan, but the commute if you're not living in Michigan, if that makes sense. Right. So breaking down like relocating, you know, the main points of a mortgage that a lender is looking at is your credit, your ID, your income and your assets. The biggest thing with a relocation is going to be your income and your ability to repay the mortgage. So if you're coming from California to Michigan, do you have a job lined up? Do you have a job offer letter is a key thing to keep in mind. What's your start date? What's your title? how much are you going to be making, and do you have related work history in that field previously. Now as far as commuting from California to Michigan was the example in our question, I mean that's, that's something to bring up right away with your loan officer to have an underwriter look at because, you know, how are the commu commute expenses being handled by the company? Um, it, who's living in the property? Because I'm assuming we're talking about a primary residence. So you want to be clear and honest about your um, intent to occupy the home. Is it really a primary residence? Is it a second home? Is it an uh, investment property? Who's going to be living in it and how, how often during the year? Gotcha. And I know another thing too is the two years of job history in a related industry. So that has been something that a lot of people have been asking me too. They have, let's say they have a job in the automotive industry in California and then they Maybe they were there for a little bit, maybe not so much two years, but then they get the job offer for Michigan for automotive. How does that? So the other thing about job history is there's other things that you can use. You can use college transcripts if you have any training. You can go back further prior uh, from the automotive history. Say you, say you worked any job in California, automotive, Michigan. Usually these jobs are salary jobs or there's guaranteed income. That's going to make the lender um, feel confident that you're going to have the ability to repay that mortgage. Gotcha. And on to the second question we have, what documents should we comp compile for a lender since we are moving from out of state and how early should they be submitted? Okay, got you. Um, I would just go back to the ID, income, and assets. So your ID is your driver's license, your income, you probably have some pay stubs and W-2s to show your prior work history, but that main component, again, is the job offer letter. Mm -hmm. When does it start? What's the pay rate? What's your position and title? And then the last thing would be your asset statement. So your bank statement, 401k, retirement funds, to show what do you have set aside for down payment and closing costs. So I, for the people that don't know, in terms of an offer letter, do do lenders lean on those pretty hard, even if you don't have the work history? They just have this letter that pretty much seals proof to, to making that? Right. So, for, for example, right now I have a nurse moving from Tennessee up to Michigan, and they have their job offer letter from University of Michigan Hospital 
stating, you know, the nursing position, salary, the con contingencies before she starts and the start date. So they're, you know, the job offer letter, they're going to call your HR department, verify. If you started work, you might need to provide a pay stub. If you haven't started yet, that's when they're probably going to lean on that job history field. Okay. Moving on to question number three, a lot of people had is about there being affiliates in their home state versus the ones in Michigan. Like, let's say you you bank with Chase and then you go to Michigan and there's a Chase. Do you just do a loan through them and what's the benefits there? Got you. So there's really four channels where you can get a mortgage from. So there's banks like Chase and Bank of America. There's direct lenders like Cross Country Mortgage, Guaranteed Rate, Quicken Loans. There's credit unions like Lake Michigan Credit Union, Genesis Credit Union in Michigan locally. And then there's mortgage brokers such as Iris Mortgage. So those are kind of your four channels. Most of these loans are um, through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac anyway. So it's kind of just about shopping around and doing your due diligence, working with somebody you're comfortable with, and securing the best terms for you. It's also a good idea to lean on your real estate agent who has that local knowledge of what lenders are going to be able to get the job done efficiently and help you out in the best way possible and have that kind of local insight. So there's nothing wrong with having your chase to chase affiliation and you might, you might have some incentives because you have an existing banking relationship, but that's really the only reason, um, you know, it's a matter of securing the best terms, right? And working who you're comfortable with. So would you say, do you have a story or a situation where somebody shopped around and they shopped with you and you just knocked it out of the park with just having a way better? Because I think there, there's a misconception about lenders where, yes, they could be all under, you know, Freddie Mac and they offer the similar services, but then they, they turn around and put fees on you. So was there a moment you had where you just knocked it out of the park when someone actually shopped around and kind of told you what their situation was like before. Right. Um, I do a lot of veterans loans and what I see is with big box uh, lenders like Veterans United or New Day USA or Navy Federal, they actually, they're not the best option for the veterans. There's a lot of extra charges and fees. So it's either, you know, it's either a, results in a higher interest rate or higher fees. So it's always just best, you know, do your due diligence, shop around, always look at what's called a locked loan estimate. It's a standard document from the CFPB. And what I start is, um, you know, I always start by listening first and trying to help educate the clients that are shopping around. Okay, this is how you can look through your locked loan estimate. What fees are there in terms of origination? Are you getting a lender credit? So comparing and contrasting those loan estimates and, and shopping around is encouraged. A lot of lenders will say, don't get your credit pulled, it's gonna screw you up. Mm -hmm. Really, you have 45 days to shop around um, without it affecting your credit if it's all pulled for a mortgage. So do your due diligence, be a smart consumer, and look out for yourselves, number one. Yeah, that was actually gonna be one of the questions I was gonna ask you at the end was, a lot of people just think that when they're shopping around that they just do it once they get the credit pull but then there was always this misconception people had where I think I heard that you can do it a couple times in this short frame window and not get hit so that was, that was good for you to say right so yeah again you have 45 days so when you when you actually get your credit pulled it, it's a uh, Experian TransUnion and Equifax are the bureaus and that credit pull is registered as a mortgage credit pull so you might also get phone calls from solicitors and text messages. So be careful who you're working with. There's some sharks out there, but um, it's not going to affect your credit as long as it's within that 45-day window. And then the credit report's good for 120 days for your shopping, especially that comes into play with relocating, right? Because mm -hmm. that's four months. Right, right. And I, that's that's I think that's good to keep in mind for a lot of people out there when they're shopping around because a lot of the times they they talk about people when they ask me they say oh how early should i do this how early should i do that kind of make their timelines line up and i just say as soon as possible right i also agree with you because you can hold off on the credit pull too for example some people aren't ready to shop until after the new year or after they list their home because 
listing and buying is going to be really common on a relocation, right? Mm -hmm. you gotta, you got to dial in your numbers. It could affect your down payment. But the sooner you have the discussion so your real estate agent and your loan officer can work as a team and truly understand your situation, check in those documents, it's just going to be less of a headache during the process. That, that kind of leads me to another question is, as far as starting the process early, is there let's just say, because there's, there's people that have reached out to me and when I say as early as possible, let's just say there's a hiccup in your credit, then they're like, okay, work on this, do this. I mean, is there a situation, maybe a real situation you have where you caught somebody early on, whereas if they just went to you last minute, it would have just been like, you're not getting a house. Okay, I would say two specific examples. So um, I had a client who never had credit, right? They paid things cash. He couldn't get a mortgage. When I pulled his credit, no scores came up, right? So you can still get a mortgage through the FHA with no credit scores. You just have to be able to show three trade lines. So do you pay rent on time? Do you pay a cable bill on time? Do you pay a cell phone bill on time? So you can manually add three trade lines and have a viable file. The reason for that story is that he bought a couple years ago before um, while interest rates were good and before home values went high. So if he had waited to build his credit, mm -hmm. what could have happened, right? He might not even have a house. So it's always good to do your best attempt to try and secure a property. You can always refinance later. You can always keep working on your credit. So for example, believe it or not, you can get a credit, you can get a mortgage with as little as a 500 score with the FHA. So Secure the mortgage. If you have your eye on a dream home and you need it, or you're relocating and you're in a pinch, secure the property. There's plenty of ways to work on your credit. I've also had times where I had a 660 credit score and a young woman didn't even know that she had a collection from Western Michigan on her credit. So we took a look at that and turns out it had been paid years ago and she had proof of it. We turned that into the credit bureaus and she was a 740 plus credit. Jeez. So the earlier you work on that, the more time you get to resolve that. So start early. There could be ways to get your credit score up during the process and then you'll get updated better pricing before you close. That's a good point, especially going back to that first story you had, whereas I think, I mean, if you, if you start asking your peers like, okay, what should I do? I want to get a house. I have no credit and then they just start opening up credit cards, paying their stuff on time, then they're, maybe their debt to income ratio is off or the credit utilization, whatever. So I think it's good that you said that where there's actually other ways to do it without having to just say, oh, I need to hurry up and build my credit. So that was, that was a good point there. So this one is kind of a particular, this, this next question is kind of a particular situation where there's, there's actually been a few people who have been in the California area who because a lot of people down there are in the TV film industry, so I think this could kind of hit home for a couple people. For instance, uh, this, this person's husband will work for various employers within the industry throughout the year. They also take off chunks of time in between filming as like a hiatus, and it could be a month or two off at a time before they resume filming. Would this cause any issues when securing a mortgage in Michigan? And I think not just in the film industry. I mean, you could you could look at a realtor, you could look at a mortgage lender and say, hey, I've been producing these months and hey, New Year's, Christmas time, it's slow, a couple months, let's just say. So how does that look for, for securing a mortgage? Okay, so the, the two things I'm looking at here is, the first is occupancy. Are you buying a primary residence and how is that gonna affect commuting to your job? Or is all the work in California it, and then you're living in Michigan, like that might not exactly make sense to underwriter. You might have to write a letter of explanation or just be cognizant of that. Where is the work at? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, just back to like the meat and potatoes of the question, would be what do I do with all these 1099s? Well, when you're a 1099, you might have multiple from different companies or real estate agent, mortgage broker, um, electrical workers in the union. Mm -hmm. They might get multiple 1099s or some W-2s. People pay out however they pay out. When it comes down to it with something like that, you wanna focus on the last two years of tax returns. You're gonna average those two tax returns, the, the gross income divided by 24 months. You have your monthly income, and that's probably a good 
good gist of what you can use for your income to qualify. So so really at the end of the day, it's just a numbers game. It's not whether or not you had 30 employers in the past two months. Right. And as long as the underwriter, it also could um, come into part, how long have you been doing that 1099 style filmmaking? You know, did you just start or do you have two plus years where you have that good average and the underwriters can, you know, um, you know, confident that you have that ability to repay the mortgage. Gotcha. So job history is important with that one. In terms of the real estate aspect, this this is question number five. So I I answered this this person one on one, but I wanted to make sure that that I answered it for everybody here. So I know on my side we can, but I can talk about the mortgage side too. So do we need to be present in Michigan to sign documents or can they be e signatures? Okay, so a lot of the loan process, especially starting off your initial loan estimate, loan documents, once you have a purchase agreement, those can all be e-signed. When it comes to closing, um, there's two different ways to do it. You can sign in person and a, a notary will come out to you, like out in California, wherever you're at. They'll come to your house, they'll come to your work, they'll go to a Starbucks. You can really close anywhere with a notary. And now lenders have hybrid closings where you can e-sign a majority of the documents and sign a few in front of a notary. Usually it's going to be face to face or even over like a video chat like Zoom. They have to make sure your ID matches the person and you're really the person mm -hmm. signing. So at the end of the day, it's not all electronic. And would you say that that, I mean, I've noticed it myself, but would you say it's kind of became more active in that way of closing just because of COVID for the most part? Yeah, definitely. Like we've had people close in their cars during COVID. They show their ID, title agent puts their documents through the window, they sign them all up, they're on the phone walking them through it. So it's very common. It's more about just accommodating you. There's no reason to fly to Michigan for a closing, spend the extra money to be face to face when a remote notary can come out to you. Right. Same thing. All right. So check with your title or escrow company with how they handle the closing. And honestly, I, I would probably go as far as saying if if they didn't say you could, I mean, I, I'd i feel like you almost should shop around for them. Yeah, 100%. you got to work with somebody who meets your needs, right? Mm -hmm. So is it worth the travel expense versus, you know, you, you got to weigh out, weigh out the loan options and weigh out the flexibility of the lender. Yeah, because I, I mean, I've heard in situations where people, same relocation situation where the title company wasn't very flexible with that and said, oh, you have to fly out here. And then so they were flying out there for their walkthrough and then had to stay another day for their closing. So it was like a two, three day event and you're paying flight both ways. You're paying for a hotel. I mean, and it's, th those aren't fun. Answer. Those aren't fun expenses. You want to buy a flat screen TV. You want to buy furniture. Mm -hmm. You don't want to spend money flying, staying in hope, probably not the best hotel if you're mm -hmm. just getting by and it's not with really a main purpose. So I definitely agree. Either shop title, shop lender, lean on your realtor, real estate agent for some suggestions. Yeah. So I, I definitely say for everybody watching and listening out there that if just because I've seen it myself is if you, you come across this issue or just make sure you ask up front and just say, hey, does your title company recommendation, do they do this, do they do that, does the lender do this, do they do that? Asking those questions up front can definitely save you some headache going forward, that's for sure. So the next one is a little bit more of an open-ended question. What is your biggest piece of mortgage advice for someone moving from one state to another? My biggest piece of advice is communicate early. What are your main goals? What are you trying to accomplish? Do you have a home for sale? Is it contingent? Are you contingent on selling that home to secure another mortgage? What happens if that house doesn't sell? Can we put a lower down payment down? Do we have a plan B? Can we add a co-signer to help your debt to income ratio carry both mortgage payments? So that's kind of my biggest piece of advice is start planning early, start talking about it early, come up with a plan A, B, and C. Um, my next piece of advice would be just get all your documents together and you don't have to know all the answers. You're lean on your real estate agent and your lender to help navigate and guide you. And you'll probably be a little less anxious during the process. I mean, I, I know this just from hearing from lenders, but would you say the biggest setback or 
hold up of the whole process is essentially just you not getting your documents in time? Or? I would say it's on the loan officer, whoever's pre-approving you. You know, are they pre-qualifying or pre-approving you? Right. Are they doing a thorough job? Are they telling you, okay, everything looks good right now. For example, a uh, nurse moving from Tennessee to Michigan. I have everything I need, but her... But what I do need is, she's contingent on selling that Tennessee home. So I'm telling her in advance, hey, we need to get your VA entitlement restored by selling this home so we can get your new VA loan for 100% financing. You're going you're gonna to owe me a settlement statement or closing disclosure so I can turn that into the VA and get you situated for your new home. And no matter what point. So laying things out, having a game plan, and what happens if things don't go according to plan? Can we do a conventional loan and, and have a little audible there? Mm -hmm. What are our other options? Right. So I, I guess going going back to your first point about being thorough, just just for anybody watching and listening, what would, what is the biggest difference without going too in depth on either or? Is the biggest difference between pre qualification and pre approval? Because people think it's interchangeable, the same thing. Got you. So a pre qual. You're just saying, hey, I'm Andrew, this is what I make. This is kind of like my debt situation. These are my car payments. You know, how much mortgage can I fit in? Well, I didn't pull your credit. I didn't ver verify any of your pay stubs or income. I didn't really do a thorough job. It was just like, it's still great guidance, but, you know, your Credit Karma FICO score isn't the same one that a mortgage pulls up, right? So it could affect your product, your pricing, you know, I've had people say, hey, I have great credit, I go to pull it, and we're kind of in the lower 600s, mid-600s. That could be like FHA territory where it's a little bit different rules and ball game. Mm -hmm. Not a bad loan at all, it's a great product, but you just it's just better to go right for it, get pre-approved, credit pulled, all documents checked in, run it through an underwriting system. It might benefit you because certain properties may be eligible for an appraisal waiver um, and you can tell that from day one through an underwriting process. And just just from you touching on that, just for people that don't know, what what is an appraisal waiver and what's the benefit in that? So when you're underwriting a file, we have a desktop underwriting system and I have all your information integrated in my system. I even have the property address. I can see if you're putting 20% down or more, um, Will Fannie Mae give me an appraisal waiver or will Freddie Mac give me an appraisal waiver? Which investor should I choose to place your loan with? Because um, if there's there's a aggregated data that determines a home value, especially because values are higher. So if there's a good there's low risk if you're putting twenty percent down or more that you're gonna default, um, the system might grant you an appraisal waiver, which will save you five, six hundred bucks. And a lot of time and stress. The the sellers are stressed about the appraisers just as much as the buyers. So um, if you can skip that step, it turns into a really fast, smooth closing. And this one, I actually, this last question, I kind of just threw it in here, but just because you, you look at all these headlines lately and it's just gloom and doom. I mean, you, you look back a, a year ago and you see where the, the mortgage rates were and where they are now and everyone just thinks, so oh, it's 2008, everything's on fire. Uh, how should a buyer maneuver in this market? What should they do to maximize their approval and get the most house possible with the mortgage rates being higher as they are now? Great question. So I would just consult your loan officer. There are some uh, products with the temporary buy-downs that we know where you can have a lower interest rate initially and the seller you can use seller concessions to pay um, part of your principal every month so you have a lower interest rate. Um, the other thing you could take an we could look at an adjustable rate mortgage where it's fixed for three, five, seven years at a time, and then it will adjust. So that might help you secure a lower than market rate. Or you can just take that market rate. You know, sometimes when you're relocating, it's securing a roof above your head, or it's a means to an end. You don't have all the time in the world to shop. You want to do your best. The other thing I encourage is. Shop around to make sure you're taking an interest rate at a really low cost. Don't buy down the interest rate. If the, if the par interest rate, meaning a no cost interest rate is 7%, no points, fees, or anything, 
don't spend two points or two percent of the loan amount buying it down to six and a half. Take the seven percent, take a low cost interest rate, and then hit the points later when the market is always like a roller coaster, right? Stay in touch with your loan officer, stay in tune with the market, look for opportunities to refinance and hit the home run later. For example, I bought in 2018, my interest rate was a 4.8. I didn't buy down any points or do any anything because I felt optimistic about where interest rates were going, mm -hmm. um, especially with you know election cycles, Brexit. You see all these all these ripples, COVID. You know, COVID came along, that was a great opportunity to refinance and secure a low interest rate. And rates go up and down. So it's just part of the market. Everybody's dealing with it. But if you can afford that mortgage right now at the higher interest rate, you're you're beating out competition right now. Mm -hmm. And then you might be rewarded later with a lower rate. Right. And then that's that's what I've always told people is if you can afford it and go for it because there's no harm in building equity early. Also keep this in mind, the average lifespan of a mortgage is really two to three years right now. So you're getting a 30-year fix, but people are refinancing, people are upgrading their home, people are selling for whatever reason. So life happens, we all know that, and you roll with the punches and do the best you can in the moment. Gotcha. So I, I guess the, the last thing is, is do you have, for anybody listening out there, do you have a piece of advice for them? Do you have maybe a frequently asked question that they should be asking, something something along those lines? I would say just being in the mortgage world, shop around and do your diligence. If somebody's not encouraged, if your real estate agent's saying, you got to use my go-to guy and they're going really hard on you for it, just always look out for yourself. Shop around, do your due diligence, work with somebody who's responsive. You're going to be shopping for home, homes on the weekend. You don't want somebody that's working 9 to 5 Monday through Friday. You need somebody who's available and accessible. It's okay to have boundaries as a mortgage professional or a real estate agent, you know, after 9, 10 o'clock. But you need to have some flexibility, availability, and accessibility so that you can crank out pre-approvals, give quotes, and be there for your client. So look for somebody who's available for you and really has your best interest in mind mm -hmm. so do your own diligence to find that person awesome so i for all the people out there we just threw a ridiculous amount of information at them so if they have questions or want to look you up what's the best way for them to find you 313-655-2423 shoot me a text message instagram chris thomas mortgage um email chris at irismortgage.com so I make it so there's any way you're comfortable interacting with me, I'm available for you. Instagram, TikTok, email, Facebook Messenger, text or call. However you want to communicate, I do also have a fax machine. We can fax back and forth. <laughs> it's just going to be a little bit slower. Thanks, everybody, for watching. If you liked this video and if you liked watching Chris and listening to our little conversation here, don't forget to give this video a big old thumbs up hit the subscribe button, and hit the little bell so you never miss out on any video that I upload. And stay tuned for the next video that starts right now. I think we're good. Thanks.